you're pretty much ready. Okay, so it's live. I might be letting some people in while I'm getting Facebook Live going. So, um, and we are officially, uh, I will pause the recording actually right now. And I will, I guess we'll get started. Oh, thank you everybody for joining those um, through Zoom and also through Facebook Live. So I'm going to click record now on my end for Zoom. And I will, I guess we'll get started. Okay, so that, I guess that was me back playing myself. Um, so thank you again for everybody for joining. This is the third week of our newly created FPF Resilience webinar series. Um, has been developed to continue our work to enhance the business and entrepreneurial skills of native artists and cultural bearers, as well as expand our virtual community during these rapidly changing times. Every week, First Peoples Fund and our nationally recognized Native Arts Professional Development or NAPD trainers will deliver values-based topic-focused webinar on Mondays, followed by a technical assistance office hours on Wednesdays to follow up and answer any questions regarding the Monday webinar. Uh, the month of May, the, the topics that we have left is um, we're doing planning the artist calendar today with Leslie Deer, um, but we do have next week a performing arts focus with Tanea Winder. Um, we will be taking the week of Memorial Day off, um, but in June, we do have some confirmed trainers. We have Ben Sherman on business planning, Koloku Holt on performing arts and negotiation, and we also have Robert Martinez for marketing. Um, to share also some other um, virtual events that FPF is putting together and wanted to tell our community about is the Rolling Res Arts is excited to kick off uh, first events for its virtual arts celebration. The Rolling Reds Arts Program is dedicated to bringing folks in Indian country and surrounding communities. Uh, the experts and disciplines of artists within the First Peoples Fund family. On Saturday, May 12th, Michael Tubles will go live on Facebook with a printmaking demonstration and Sienna type. Um, this live event will open up with a performance by a special guest artist. So definitely come and check that out. Um, Wednesday, June 3rd at 3 p.m. on Facebook Live, we have Wade Patton to um, demonstrate some matting and framing. And on July 1st at 3 p.m. Facebook Live, Mary Jo LeBeau will demonstrate moccasin making. So that's just a little taste of what Rolling Res Arts is working hard on. Um, so just before we let Leslie take over and share her awesome knowledge and skills, I just wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping for everybody that is connected on our Zoom call as well as on Facebook Live, that this is a recorded webinar that will be on our Facebook page as well as our resource library on our FPF website and on our YouTube playlist page specifically for this resilience webinar series. So this is our third one, so you can find the other two in YouTube and those two other locations that I just mentioned. Um, if you're on Zoom, please keep yourself on mute because any noise that is made, it will take away from the presentation that Leslie's making and it, your name will be the focal point for the presentation. Um, the presentation will be one hour long with a 30 minute Q&A at the very end. And since FPF myself, Hillary Presican, hello everybody, um, I will be hosting the webinar today that um, I will be collecting questions from Facebook Lives in our comment section, as well as in our Zoom chat box. And I'll collect them all, so at the very end, so at three o'clock mountain time, I will share whatever questions um, were asked to of Leslie and go from there. Um, we will be um, stopping this webinar right at 3.30 because of a prior engagement for our presenters. So um, definitely get those questions in. But if you think of something, again, we have our Wednesday webinar for that virtual office hour. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us and come to that as well with your questions. So without further ado, I have the privilege and honor to introduce Leslie Deer of the Muskogee Nation of Oklahoma, focusing on the planning of the artist calendar. Thank you so much. Here you go, Leslie. All yours. Hi. Thank you so much, Hillary, and hello to everyone out there. Thank you for joining us today for uh, this uh, presentation in the Resilience Webinar Series. I'm happy to be here and share just the little bit that I know and my experiences about planning an artist calendar. So, you know, during this time of isolation and lockdown, um, sadly, a lot of our uh, 
opportunities to earn income, our, our native art markets have been canceled. But uh, in another way, it's also an opportunity to plan and prepare and to get ahead, to get a little bit organized so that we can put our focus back onto our artwork and continue to do our best work, take more time to experiment, to collaborate, to do lots of different things with our artwork. So we are gonna look at planning an artist calendar. And basically what that is, is uh, we're going to look at uh, planning and preparation of um, researching and attending art markets. Or if you're a performing artist, we're gonna look at uh, planning a tour. So uh, we're gonna take those and then we're gonna kind of put them onto a timeline, uh, therefore uh, an artist calendar. So, um, Today, we're gonna to look at major art shows. We're gonna look at show prep, art show presentation. Uh, we're going to look at how to set up a booth uh, and what you should do post-show. We're gonna look at mapping tours and performance submissions. So we're gonna take those kind of things and put them into a timeline. Um, and for starters, we're gonna start with the art show side. So uh, for artists who um, want to or have already attended art, art shows. Uh, these are some of the bigger, the major Native American art markets here uh, in, in North America. So you may or may not have heard of some of these and we'll just go through them a little bit. Um, there is the American Indian Art Marketplace at the Autry, Cherokee Nation Art Market, Idle Jorg, Heard Museum, Longhouse Holiday Native Arts Fair, Native Hawaiian Arts Market, uh, National Museum of the American Indian Native Arts Market, Northern Plains Indian Art Market, uh, Red Earth Native American Festival, and of course, Santa Fe Indian Market. So um, <clears throat> just to look at these a little bit closer, uh, the American Indian Arts Marketplace at the Autry takes place out in Los Angeles. It's good to kind of do some research and get an idea of uh, where these art markets take place and also know what time of year they take place so you can kind of start to uh, plan out your timeline. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit further as we get along. Um, so uh, Cherokee Nation Art Market takes place in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and that usually happens every October. So it's good to know when they happen and also you have to know ahead of time uh, what the deadline to apply is. So you've got to do a little bit of research here and we'll get to that. Uh, the Idol Jorg Museum is in Indianapolis, Indiana, and that is, I believe, like the last weekend of June. It's usually the end of June. And then there is the Heard Museum uh, Indian Fair. So all of these, I have some links here to uh, the organizations and some of these link right to the application and some go to uh, their major market page that is kind of for tourism and for the public. So uh, maybe let's see if we can get this to work and we will just try to look at, look at one of these real quick. Well, let's see, I don't see it coming up. Let me try it again. Here we go. So this is the um, webpage for the Heard Museum's Indian Fair and Market. And of course that takes place in uh, March. So that has already passed for 2020, but you can find here the dates for next year. You know, as I mentioned, we're making a calendar, we're planning for the future. Um, and getting organized. So you can already even pencil those dates down if you're interested in the herd Indian market. It is going to be the first weekend of March of 2021. So um, it's got a lot of information here. And then there's even a section that just says click here for artists. So um, that's one art market. Um, and I think that Hillary also is gonna post these on Facebook so that you can, you can uh, check out those links there as well. Um, but just to <clears throat> go back to our little graph here. Um, there is also a uh, Longhouse Holiday Arts Fair, uh, which is in Olympia, Washington. I tried to look that up and I didn't find a lot of information. It looks like uh, they're not having anything this year. That, uh, it's been postponed till maybe next year. And then there's also um, Native People of the Plains and that's in Rapid City, South Dakota. So, um, Let's see if we can take a look at this one real quick and um, and uh, see what we can find about their website here. So this is a uh, Native People of the Plains, <clears throat> and they actually had something fun here. They have a little video about their art market. 
Uh, and you can look down if you want to and see that there, theirs is coming up on July the 18th, 2020. Um, it doesn't say that it's canceled, so maybe it is still going to take place. Of course, the deadline is probably already passed to apply for this year. But just so you know, uh, to keep records, that takes place in July pretty much of every year. So we will um, check out this little video real quick. It gives you a good idea for those of you who maybe have not attended a major art market before and would like to. This is just a little taste of uh, kind of what happens at art markets here. Let's check this out. Oh, heck, I forgot to share my audio, so hang on just a second. All right, let's try it. know why but just watching videos like that with art markets it, it really gets me all excited and makes me want to like get ready for the next art market but uh, I actually don't even having anything coming up myself in the future most of the events that I was planning to participate in have been canceled so um, just just have to get ready for next year and look forward to the future because I'm sure that things will be back in place uh, sometime in the future and there are also as I'll mention here in a minute other exciting things in the works uh, so just to continue with our major art markets, uh, the Native Hawaiian Arts Market takes place in Honolulu, Hawaii. And I believe that that is um, produced or, or sponsored by the Pi Foundation and you can find more information there at pifoundation.org. Uh, National Museum of the American Indian Native Art Market takes place in December and there is one in New York and one in Washington, DC. Um, so definitely worth looking into those if you like either one of those locations like to be back in the uh, eastern side of the country in the winter time that would be the market for you. Uh, Northern Plains Indian Art Market is in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, Red Clown Indian Art Show uh, also in Sioux Falls, South Dakota and um, gosh I'm trying to remember when Red Cloud is. Uh, but moving on to Red Earth, Red Earth usually takes place uh, the second weekend in June in Oklahoma City. However, uh, that has been postponed this year. I have heard maybe that they might try to hold it in October, but I haven't seen anything finalized on that yet. So this is all just to kind of show you and get an idea of when and where these events take place so that you can start to try and keep in the back of your mind which ones might be doable for you as far as travel and which ones might not. Um, and then of course, Santa Fe Indian Market um, in Santa Fe, New Mexico um, in August. Santa Fe, of course, is probably the largest Native American art market in the world. And um, we'll see if we can look at their website and, and um, they've done something really exciting that's coming up here. They have already canceled, they have already canceled uh, Indian Market for this August. Um, but they have uh, they have uh, decided to go virtual. They're going to have a virtual online Indian market. So that's really exciting. And this should go live, I believe. They're aiming for August. Uh, so it's for, for uh, juried artists who have already been juried in for the 2020 show. Um, you have the opportunity to uh, participate in the virtual market. Indian Market does something really nice for their juried artists and they have a um, kind of a little page for each one of their artists. And just to give you an example here, uh, you can see that alphabetically every artist is listed here. And um, you can look up and find out a little bit of in information about each one of the artists, but they're going to give artists the ability to link up your web pages or build an e-commerce site here. Uh, and it will be active for uh, an entire year until the 2021 uh, Santa Fe Indian Market. So that's a wonderful opportunity and that's something very exciting, gives 
a lot of the artists uh, a chance to uh, earn some of their income, some of the income that we have lost as artists by not being able to attend and participate in these art markets. So uh, that's really something exciting to look forward to if you are a juried um, artist for Santa Fe or if you are planning to do that in the future. Uh, and you can find out more information at swaiaswaya.org. Uh, and again, I think uh, Hillary will have these links for you. So uh, now that we've researched some of the major art markets, we are going to look at a little bit of show prep and what goes into prepping for a show. And then, as I mentioned, uh, at the end, we will put all this in a timeline. So one of the first things to do when you think you want to attend a particular art market is to research and identify that show, um, figure out some information about it. You can um, certainly determine what the location is, how many days it is, um, and you want to look at how far it is from your from your home or from your studio, what will it cost to get there? Would you fly, would you drive? Um, what are the gas prices like? So it, all things that go into consideration. Um, and definitely you want to find out ahead of time what is provided for your booth as far as setup. Some art markets only give you a roof over your head. Some provide tables and chairs and electricity and pipe and drape. It, it really varies from one market to the next. So it's, it's good to do some homework and look into these things. You also sometimes need to research um, how to file for uh, a sales tax ID number because a lot of these major art markets do require you to have a sales tax ID number for their state. To make sure that you're reporting the proper taxes. Um, and also, this is something that I learned over time, you want to know the physical work involved in um, setting up your booth at an art market. For example, are you, if it's an outdoor art market, are you allowed to pull up in front of your booth and unload your equipment? Or do you have to park several blocks away and then carry things in one at a time? So for example, since I'm an apparel designer, my equipment consists of things like a grid wall, dress forms, clothes racks, bag after bag of uh, garments, uh, mirrors, carpet, things like that. And so if I'm not able to pull up in front of my booth and unload those things, I can fit them all in my car. Uh, but once I get everything packed in there to travel to an art market, I don't have room to fit another person in there. So I usually go by myself, which means I have to carry all those things one at a time from my car to my booth space. And I've actually done that plenty of times, just carried grid wall one piece at a time or five, six blocks down the road. So uh, you have to know what you can and can't do and decide if you're willing to do those things or not. So that can be a hindrance or a help sometimes. Some of the other things to look for when you are trying to determine um, uh, what art, mar art markets to go to is um, determine uh, the types of art that you would want to sell there and the price range for your target market. You definitely have to know who your target market is and you want to know if those are the kind of people that show up at these shows that you're planning to attend. So you can always talk to other artists who have already participated in the show and you know get a feel for it. What's it like? You know, what what is what is the clientele there? What are the collectors? What are they looking for? Um, and those sorts of things is definitely handy. Uh, it wouldn't do me any good to go to a show where uh, people are there to collect baskets and pottery and I have women's wear. So it really helps to uh, try and find out as much as you can about a show before you plan to go to it. Um, again, you have to consider your inventory and production demands. You know, what will you take and how much of it will you take? Uh, it's good to think too, if you're planning to attend um, two art markets that are uh, not far apart from each other uh, time-wise, uh, because if you go to the first art market and you do very well, that's always really great and exciting. But if, if the other art market is two weeks later, you may not have enough turnaround time to produce more uh, of your art. So it's, it's always something to look at and consider. You definitely wanna see if the show is well attended, uh, what kind of traffic do they have there over their two or three or one day event. See if even your target market is, is actually there. Uh, you have to talk to fellow artists and um, see if they found the show to be viable. And there again, you know, it varies from one art form to another sometimes. So you might want to try and talk to artists who have artwork um, along the same lines as you. 
another thing that you can look at is how well is a show promoted and um, do, show, do show promoters demand a percentage of sales on top of the booth fees? I personally have never been to a show where they've asked that of me, but um, I know that it does happen sometimes. So uh, you do wanna be aware of that ahead of time. So uh, once you have done your research and applied to um, the art markets of your choice, and we're going to assume that you did receive an acceptance letter, the next step is uh, to work on your promotional message. You want to uh, have photos ready, resumes, artist statements, brochures, even as you go to market, you'll be surprised um, what kind of opportunities come up and where people might ask for these things. People come along and say, we wanna come do a radio spot in your booth or we wanna do a TV spot. Do you have a resume? Do you have a brochure? Do you have something we can give to the host? You know, uh, so it's good to have these kind of things handy. Prepare for what presentation or what image you want to put forward. Um, and then you also need to plan for your sales presentation. You know, you've got to think about how you're going to uh, price your artwork, even where you're going to put your prices. You, if you are an artist who likes to do wholesale, you do want to have your wholesale information uh, not out where everyone can see it, but you do want to have that somewhere handy in case there is a wholesaler who comes to visit you. So um, I know uh, that I have always tried to have my prices ready on my artwork and a tip that I learned, I listened to another presentation from another First People's Fund artist, um, Jason Brown, and, um, and he was talking about having an inventory list for pricing your work. Even though you do put your price on your work somewhere, sometimes things happen, people look at things, people touch things, and the price might fall off, the price tag might come off somewhere. So when a next person comes along and asks how much something is and you can't find the price, um, it's good to have an inventory list to refer to that has all of your prices. You don't want to just stand there and think about it and say, hmm, I think that that was about, you know, and just throw out a number because a lot of times it makes people uncomfortable. It makes collectors feel like maybe you're just sizing them up and, and just throwing out a price. Uh, so it, it gives you a lot more credibility. It looks a lot more legit to actually pull out your inventory list. Or if you have a website, you can say, I have that posted on my website. Let me look it up. But um, if you have a reference to go to, to uh, show them what the price is of that piece, then that's always really helpful too. So that's a real pro tip there. Uh, you definitely want to know your art and be able to communicate your story. Uh, I think that that is really what uh, attaches a collector to a piece, is understanding the story, understanding the background, knowing why it was made this way, what it represents, what it means, what it inspired you. So you definitely want to be able to communicate that information as well. So if you're not real practiced at doing that, it's now's a good time to practice, you know, talking about your artwork. And uh, if you can, it's good to keep a, keep a little database, keep customer information, names and addresses. Um, just maybe you want to thank them later. Maybe you want to let them know, send a postcard and say, here are the next four shows that I'm going to so that they may seek you out the next time they're at another native art market. And definitely keep accurate records of all of your expenses. That will help, as you'll see here in a little bit, with your budgeting for the future. So um, again, we want to look at um, the more about determining types of art to sell and price ranges for your target market. So, oh, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> So once you have done your show, the next step, of course, is follow up. Once you're done and you pack up everything, there is still work to be done. Uh, you need to complete orders that you have taken and ship out items as soon as possible. You want to send thank you notes to your customers and be sure and for your own purposes, take notes and critique the show. What did you like? What did you dislike? What would you improve? I always make notes on how I can improve my own booth. What would make it easier for me? What would make it more appealing? those kind of things. So it's just stuff that's good to, to make a list of and keep track of. So um, this is a, a, a basic art show budget and it compares, you can see it compares the budgeted amount to the actual amount. So definitely application fees, you know, those are usually paid at the, the time you apply, obviously. 
and um, you can look that up a lot of times ahead of time. So you can budget that and the actual probably will still be the same amount. Uh, booth fees, the same thing. You can look that up and see online um, how much the size of the booths are and how much the cost is to budget that in. Um, hotel and travel, whether it's airfare or vehicle, hotels, sometimes you can consider uh, sharing a hotel room with another artist um, to defray some of your expenses. Um, you could also travel with another artist or you could consider whether it is more economical to to drive to the art market or or to fly. I'm always envious of artists that have small pieces of work, say jewelry or something, and they can pack it all in a briefcase and get on an airplane and uh, and uh, show up at their booth, lay out uh, a, a blanket or a textile and, and put their jewelry out and, and their setup. I, I'm envious of those people sometimes when I'm lugging all those dress forms and, and clothes racks, but uh, definitely uh, so for some art forms, it is easier to travel um, by air. Certainly food is another expense that you're gonna need and you just have to think about if you want to eat in a restaurant or if you want to pack an ice chest with fresh, healthy food, that's really your choice. Um, definitely supplies, uh, just things that uh, you need to get your booth ready, whether it is duct tape or cording or new banners, those kind of things, you need to budget that into your uh, expenses as well. And certainly equipment, if, you, if you're using something for the first time or if something needs to be replaced, uh, for example, in my case, that could be a dress form or a clothes rack, or if I damaged a mirror or something, uh, transporting it, then those are definitely things I would need to budget in. You also, uh, if you are going to be traveling by air, or if you are going to ship your artwork to, to collectors, then you need to account for shipping materials and shipping costs. And then, of course, there are those just those miscellaneous things that come up. So. This is a basic uh, art budget, but it's good to budget, fill in the budget side of this, and then after an event, fill in the actuals to help you plan for next year so that you can look at it later and decide if it was a viable show for you or not. So now we're going to talk about uh, tour mapping here for a moment. And um, I wanna point out that um, Next week, there is going to be a presentation for performing artists that will probably go a lot deeper into some of this information. Tanea Winder is going to do a presentation for you performing artists. So um, this is just kind of going to touch on uh, performing arts and tour mapping. But uh, definitely when you are a performing artist and creating your own tour, uh, you want to uh, maximize your opportunities by scheduling anchor dates first. So those are basically the big events or big festivals that will cover a lot of your expenses. Um, and then if those are like a day or more drive apart, once you have those anchor events in place, you'll want to fill in along the way, along your route traveling from one event to another, you'll look for places where you can fill in in between and book other events. So um, it's a good idea not to book um, too many events in one, one city, um, because if you do that, it kind of looks like you're a little bit too avail available. Uh, if you notice a lot of touring acts only maybe come through an area just once a year, and it's better to keep, um, keep in demand like that. So if, if you have a public performance and then you have also booked in that city a private performance, that's perfectly okay because the public doesn't know about that second event. So um, if you are going to uh, map a tour, it's good to start a database and you want to have a database that is searchable in probably uh, many different ways. You want to look at being able to search your database by fans, venues, uh, festivals, radio stations, print media, musicians, promoters, and producers. Uh, you can create these kind of databases either in say Excel or Google Docs. You could even keep it in an address book or you can keep information in your email contacts, but it is good to have these things at the ready. So uh, for performance submissions, um, is what you want to do is um, email or uh, contact presenters or uh, talent organizers. So you can search the web to find the names of these people. It's good to 
to get actual names so that you know um, who you're talking to and you can use their names in your communications. You can also send bulk emails to uh, lots of venues or festivals at a time. It's a good way to get your name out there and get it to many people at once. And then uh, about a week later, you would follow up with um, making personal connections to individuals uh, at each one of those venues or festivals. And um, your chances of getting a reply will be much greater when you do that. So for tour budget considerations, it's uh, very similar along the same lines uh, as budgeting for an art market. Um, you have to look at the gas prices versus the miles you're going to travel. You have to budget for service and repairs to your vehicle, plan for highway tolls and parking, food, of course, lodging, um, miscellaneous supplies, and when you are um, self-employed, maybe you have health coverage or insurance, um, equipment, you have to plan for those replaceable things, whether it's guitar strings, drumsticks, batteries, et cetera, um, things that you might need to rent. Um, if you have to pay for band members, uh, lodging and food for other members, et cetera. So um, that's a, just a kind of an overview of some of the planning that goes into preparing for an art market or uh, mapping a tour. And so now we're gonna take that information and kind of put it into a uh, timeline so that you can start to make your artist calendar and know about um, how far ahead you need to start, when you should be doing what. Again, just having this information at the ready um, and having it organized will help to save you a lot of time and give you just more time to um, enjoy making your art, which I think is probably what all of us really would rather be doing. The business side, a lot of times, is not as much fun as the creative side, but these are things that many times uh, we don't have someone to do for us, so we have to do this ourselves. So back to the art market artist side of things, um, we're going to look at a timeline for um, the artist show calendar checklist. So here we go, 12 months before the show, um, you should visit a show if possible that you would like to enter. I know that sometimes that's not always feasible. I would like to go visit the Audrey um, because I've never been there out in Los Angeles, but I know that it's a two day drive for me and I'm not willing to drive two days by myself. So, um, and I don't really want to spend the money to fly yet either. So I think that that's a, a venue that I am not able to visit yet, but there are some closer to home. There are some here in Oklahoma that I have actually gone to go visit. Um, for example, the first time uh, I was interested in attending Cherokee Art Market, which is right here in um, Oklahoma over in Tulsa, I decided to go and uh, just be a spectator one year to look at it. Uh, selling um, garments and apparel, I was concerned. I know that the event takes place in a casino, so I was concerned about uh, cigarette smoke and how that would affect my, my products. So I did go to just check out the show ahead of time. And um, to my pleasant surprise, there was no cigarette smoke odor. Um, I came home and um, I didn't, my hair didn't smell like cigarette smoke. So that was the test right there. So I wasn't so worried about it then. I got to see what the venue looked like. I saw there was a lot of traffic there. There were lots of collectors and I felt like uh, my artwork would fit in at that art market. So it was, it was really to my advantage to go and um, have a look at that show. So when it's possible, it's good to do that. You wanna do that the year before you plan to enter. Um, also, when you're there, take notes. You know, and as I just said, uh, think about if your work would fit in there. And then again, look at the traffic, look at how many people uh, attend that market, how many artist spaces are there, how many other artists have comparable work to you. That's another thing to consider sometimes. And um, also, take notes about what displays made a positive or negative impression on you. You know, sometimes you walk by some of those booths and they just pop, they just catch your eye and draw you in. You know, and it's good to take note of that. What did they do? What did they do that's different from what I do? That what is it that draws me there? What is it that I like so much? Or something that stands out maybe in a not so good way. It's good to notice those things and make sure that you don't repeat those same things. Um, if you are an artist who needs electricity for your booth, um, that's something to check on to make sure that electricity is available. And then, so 
uh, 10 to six months before a show, you want to uh, start looking for applications to come available online. And in general, uh, applications are not always available 12 months ahead of time, but they are available nine to 10 months out. So um, you definitely want to start looking for those applications online. And uh, you want to start planning to uh, get your materials together to to apply for those. A lot of the art markets um, have online applications where you can upload your images and your uh, descriptions right there on their website. So it's good to um, put all those materials together. I put everything in a folder for each separate art market and have it ready to upload when I go to apply. Um, and then organize your publicity package. You know, get things get things organized as far as are you going to have business cards? Are you going to have postcards? Are you going to have brochures? Do you want to make stickers? You know, whatever it is that you need to promote your brand and your art. Um, and then also you want to start planning your inventory. You know, what price ranges, how many pieces in each price range do you want to take to this market? Um, and then also six to three months before the show, um, you should have received notification of acceptance. Uh, to the art market and at that point you want to send a press release to local newspapers, tribal newspapers, letting everybody know that, hey, I'm accepted, I'm a juried artist and I'm gonna be at this art market. Uh, so then, then, you know, just think about your display needs, um, how are you going to show everything, start budgeting your expenses. This is also the time to start looking at making your hotel reservations and travel reservations. Um, and then um, all the while you're continuing to work on your art while you're doing this. But if you have your calendar kind of laid out and your, your dates filled in with your different art markets that you're applying to, this should really be a breeze. Uh, then one month before the show, um, mailings will go out. Uh, you'll send out things to your collectors, uh, to people who have purchased from you in the past. Uh, letting them know this is where I'm going to be. If you're in the area, please stop by. Here's my booth number, those kind of things. It's always helpful to um, help people find you, make it as easy as possible for them to locate you. And this is also the time to um, organize any loose ends. If you haven't decided on what display you want to use or you're not sure um, whether you're going to share a hotel with someone or not, make sure that you get all those things tied down and know exactly um, how it's going to work out for you. And then you also want to organize um, those printed materials, uh, whether that is the brochures, make sure you print your labels out, whatever it is. For me, I have to make hang tags for every one of my garments. So you just want to make sure that you have all that ready to go at least a month out. And once it is showtime, uh, once you arrive to the art market, um, you certainly always want to enter your competition pieces according to the criteria for the show. It's different at all shows. You know, some shows uh, you enter your juried pieces on Friday morning and they have the awards on Friday night. At uh, Santa Fe, you submit your juried pieces on Wednesday and the awards are on Friday night. So, uh, definitely have to look into that and, and know ahead of time when and where you need to be because there's usually a small window to drop off your juried pieces. And also um, it's good to know if uh, you can't be there to submit your pieces in person, if you can send a proxy, if you can send someone to submit your pieces for you. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of filling out a form and authorizing someone to do that uh, so that they can submit a piece for you because you won't be arriving until later. So <clears throat> once you do get there, enter those pieces um, and also access the layout of the show. Know where everything is. Know where the closest restrooms to your booth are. Know where you can get coffee. Know where you can get help. Um, and also you want to, as soon as you can, uh, set up your display. Some art markets let you go in a day ahead of time and set up much of your display. You want to put your signage up. Um, so that way it's it's not so much hanging over your head the, the morning of the show. So do that in advance as much as you can. It really um, tends to be quite helpful in, in terms of uh, getting things set up and, and not getting too stressed out about it all. 
Also, you know, again, once you have that layout, if you are able to, it's good to do a walkthrough of uh, the layout, a walkthrough of the event, and make note of some of the first impressions that you see, you know. Uh, record these things and keep them for your review later. Things that you might uh, want to look further into or that you might want to do different. Maybe you need a different location, whatever it is. It's good to do a walkthrough just to know what else is going on there. Know where, uh, say at Santa Fe, you know, in the center of the plaza, they have a big stage with a lot of events going on. Know where that is in proximity to you. Know what kind of things go on there. You know, if it's something that you can also participate in, for example, they have a fashion show on Sundays at Santa Fe. Um, so I was happy to learn about that the first year that I went and make sure that I participated in that. So it's good to learn the lay of the market and make notes. So definitely the day of the show, <clears throat> you want to certainly arrive early. I think, uh, for example, I use Santa Fe a lot, but that's somewhere that I go every year. And they allow you to start moving in, I think, as early as five in the morning. And the first time I went, I was literally there at five in the morning. And there are not very many people there at five in the morning, but it is a nice time to go because you can maneuver your vehicle through and get to your booth space uh, without a lot of traffic and congestion. Um, so it, I have learned to go the day before. Now they actually let you set up the day before uh, and drop off as many of the big pieces of equipment as I can and get those arranged kind of in a way that I want them, get the carpet down, those sort of things. So um, I know that it is uh, hard sometimes to get there. Things happen, you have car trouble, there's traffic, you oversleep, your alarm didn't go off, whatever. Uh, but when you get there, the more work that you have to do to put your booth together, um, as, as early collectors start to arrive and pass by or want to stop and look or ask you questions, it can certainly be an awkward feeling to be trying to put things together uh, and, and visit with people at the same time. So err on the side of caution and arrive early. Um, so now I think we are going to look at um, performing arts calendar checklist. And uh, for performing artists, you know, again, when you are planning your tour, you have to really look way out ahead into the future. A lot of venues book at least 12 months in advance. Uh, and, and so you've got to plan way ahead to get your foot in the door and make them aware of you if you want to get booked in their upcoming seasons. So um, your work and research really as a performing artist um, representing yourself involves a lot of things like reading and signing contracts, uh, securing liability insurance, uh, making decisions about, you know, extra crew like sound crew, lighting crew. Um, and then also you probably will need to settle uh, ticket prices upon signing contracts. So you're starting to seek out venues anywhere from 18 to seven months in advance, anywhere six to 12 months before the event, you're gonna be signing those contracts. So make sure that you have done your research and homework and you are prepared for that. Uh, two to four months before a performing arts tour, you want to um, keep your website and social media updated. You want to start promoting your events, letting people know this is where I'm going to be, this is my tour. If you're anywhere near here, please come check it out. You want to write a media or press release, contact the media, again, going back to your database of uh, whether it is radio stations, uh, TV stations, whoever it is that you might know or have contacts within those areas, uh, let them know that you're coming and send your press releases. Uh, you can send save the date emails to your contacts and um, again, identify the additional personnel um, that you might need to help support your your um, event uh, and also you might have to seek out volunteers to do that so it's good to keep looking looking for those things uh, months ahead of time don't don't wait until you get there the month before your performing arts event um, you want to start designing your print program distribute media releases recontact um, you know bloggers and media people that can help you promote your event and remind them, you know, this is where I'm going to be, this is where I am, I'm doing a meet and greet, whatever it is, you know, to help uh, boost uh, visual, um, the visual representation of your event. 
And then the week before the event, uh, continue to update your social media and let everybody know, keep it on their mind. The, the more repetition, the more they see it, the more they're going to remember it. So um, again, reconnect with the, the media, people that might review your event, bloggers, and um, send reminder emails to your contact list. Um, also, at this time, you can carry out your community engagement events. Uh, I um, used to be a performing artist. Uh, however, I, I did not have to handle the management side of it. I was a cast member of a dance company. So fortunately, I, I did not have to uh, go through any of the the uh, contract signing or seeking out venues or anything like that. We had booking agents and managers and all of that, but we did have to do lots of community engagement. We used to go to um, colleges and schools and do uh, uh, exchanges with dance sharing, cultural sharing. We did um, uh, press conferences, those kinds of things. So certainly look for those kind of events as well to uh, promote, promote your tour. On the opening day of your event, if not sooner, you should have your programs ready to go. Uh, prepare for the ticket taking at the door. Um, post your day of notices on your social media. Post your, um, uh, you know, just updates to everyone. Hey, here's a sneak peek of backstage or getting ready for the event or whatever it is. And, you know, hope to see you here. Just make sure that you've done everything that you possibly can to get the word out there about your event. And um, then have a great show. After your event, uh, post event, again, there is still more work to do. You wanna post your thank yous, um, and then definitely thank the, the media, the, the bloggers, the people who have reviewed you, um, who have helped to promote you. Definitely thank your volunteers and donors. And then of course you have to settle your box office and your rentals and pay your crew. So uh, that's kind of, uh, I know a little bit of a quick run through on uh, timelines, but that's, that's what it looks like to plan your event ahead of time and then start to pencil them into your calendar. Uh, again, the first step is to find the spots that you want to go to and then start doing your research there. Uh, so one last little thing we're gonna do here for the art market side is uh, look at a little bit of booth preparation. And um, this is uh, just a basic backdrop for a booth. Uh, depending on what your uh, art, art pieces are, what your um, art products are, maybe they are something that hangs, maybe they sit on displays or tables, mine go on clothes racks, but it's always good to consider your backdrop or your background. Uh, no matter what your product is, because all art markets are different and um, there may be all kinds of distracting things either to the sides of you or behind you. So sometimes it is good to kind of um, block in your space, you know, create your own background. I know at one art market that I go to, uh, the booths are set up uh, in the street from the center of the street towards the curb or the sidewalk is where your booth spaces are. And uh, so usually in the back of my booth, there is a sidewalk and there are storefronts there with that sidewalk. And there's a lot of traffic pack passing back and forth uh, behind my booth. And, and to kind of uh, block some of that out and make my booth look a little more appealing, I have been planning to um, create backdrops or kind of to block off the space so that you really don't see that traffic and all that busyness going on behind my booth because it can be distracting. So. Uh, this slide is just to show, you know, think about you can use paneling, you can use um, tripods and put a bar across them and drape fabric over it to create a background. You can uh, put grid wall and hang, hang textiles on it to create a background. I have done that before. So there are many creative ways to create a background to block out all the other busyness around you. In, in this particular example, uh, we have paintings here, and uh, I think this is just to say to center your paintings and make them as appealing as possible and keep them at eye level. It's a lot more inviting and eye-catching to have things at people's eye level when they are standing. So um, these are all hung and centered, uh, and they are at eye level. And you might notice there that little tiny table in the center of it all. 
a lot of times we do need a table in our booth, at least to conduct transactions, if not to display our work. So um, you can have a little table, you can have a big table, but try and make your table as appealing as possible too. You don't want to just set out a, a basic multi-purpose table like that and leave it. So um, a good idea is to cover it with a, uh, a textile, a fabric, a tablecloth, something you have made even to cover your table. You can even elevate it, put something under it to raise it up if it's not high enough or put something on it to bring it up to the next level. Uh, in this case, here's the table all decorated and it doesn't look anything like that simple little, little tiny table that we had earlier. So uh, you can see it's a great way to display your smaller artwork pieces. Um, maybe those are brochures or a book that this artist has illustrated on the table. He's got his business cards there on the table. And uh, business cards is one of those things that you kind of just have to find out what is good for you, what works for you. I have heard pros and cons both way um, about putting your business cards out and um, about not putting your business cards out. And uh, the pros for putting your business cards out are that if, if you happen to be busy with another client or, or collector um, and you're not able to talk to everyone who steps into your booth, they can pick up a card and have some information about you to take with them and they can be on their way. And the cons of putting your business cards out are that uh, people can pick up your card without talking to you and they can leave. They don't have the opportunity to engage with you or even to, um, to remember you later. And I know that I have personally been guilty of that myself where I've been to uh, conferences or events and picked up business cards, I'm really excited about it. I'm gonna save this, I'm gonna keep it for later. And uh, uh, getting home and then going through those cards a couple weeks later and going, what, I don't remember what this is for. I don't know why I have this card. I don't know anything about this and I'm just gonna toss it. So that can happen too. So they say that if you don't display your business cards, people have to ask you for one. And then you have just that moment to uh, make an impression on them, to have just a small exchange with them, to say something, to interact with them and therefore become um, just a, a little bit more uh, memorable to them so that uh, when they do get home with your business card, they can say, uh, yes, I remember this person. I remember this event. I've also heard, and uh, I have not tried this yet myself, but I've heard that it's good to put a uh, small photo of yourself somewhere on your business card because that does jog people's memories as well. So whether you display your business cards or don't display your business cards uh, is entirely up to you. Sometimes it's just trial and error. I've heard people too say that I put my business cards out and lots of kids just ran through and picked them up to play with. And then I saw them laying all the way down the street <laughs> and around the corner. So it, it just, it's up to you really. You just have to kind of do trial and error and see what works for you. Another good thing to point out about this booth display here, I want to point out is these, uh, these credit card um, signs that are hanging here in this booth. Uh, this artist has chosen to let people know that he accepts Discover, MasterCard, Visa, American Express, and it looks like, I don't know, Diners Club or something. Uh, but um, again, that's something that, that each artist has to work out for themselves. Uh, sometimes it, you want to uh, make that sale a little bit easier for, for a collector and you want to let them know up front, hey, I can process credit cards, no problem at all, so that they don't have to go through the awkward you know, question and do, can you take a credit card? Do I have to have cash? You know, a lot of people sometimes, you know, don't want to run down to the nearest ATM if they don't have enough cash on them. So it's helpful to let them know that you, you do take credit cards. Um, but just be beware that if you, if you don't have a credit card processing machine now, just know that all of the credit card processing companies, uh, Square, uh, PayPal, etc. they all take a uh, percentage of your sale as a fee. It's a small percentage. It might be 2% or 3%, but um, it adds up if you do a lot of sales. You know, they take a cut of your sale. So um, if, if you would prefer to encourage people to take cash, maybe you want to uh, not display this kind of signage in your booth space, you know, and that, that way people might assume that you don't take cards and then know that they need to pay cash. 
it, it's entirely up to you again, you know, whatever, uh, if you're willing to, to take the credit cards and, and it's not a problem for you to, to give up that little percentage for the transaction processing, then, then um, it, it's certainly a good idea. It definitely, I think, makes it easier on the collectors. I know that sometimes I have gone shopping at, at art markets and festivals and different things and see something I like but didn't have cash. And I was like, oh gosh, I'm, I don't know if they take credit cards and I can't get the girl's attention. So I'm just gonna forget it. But you know, if this information was displayed, I might hang around and, and wait my turn to uh, hand over my credit card and, and make a purchase. So um, just some different things to consider about having your booth space and um, just to um, have a look at what it looks like to have a booth at a Native American art market. So um, it, it feels like this, maybe it didn't feel like it to you, but it feels like this went by really fast and I just touched on things, but it's just a kind of a brief uh, little overview of what it takes to prepare uh, uh, to attend an art market, how to plan ahead, how to book the event, how to plan your tour, um, and how to put it in a timeline, what you should be doing 18 months in advance or 12 months in advance, where you should be at six months in advance, uh, just to help keep yourself uh, on a schedule and keep yourself organized so that uh, you don't get too stressed out and overwhelmed six weeks before the show trying to do everything, trying to make travel arrangements, trying to uh, get brochures printed, trying to locate photographs for promotions, trying to get a banner ordered, all those kind of things. So um, it, it is going to be something that's customized and unique and different for each one of you, whether you, you know, uh, do an online calendar, whether you keep a weekend or book with you that plans things by the month. Uh, but it's definitely a doable practice and something that can work for you to your advantage to, again, help you stay focused on your artwork. So uh, I hope that you have enjoyed this presentation. Uh, there's one more slide here, too, that I forgot. This uh, is a, a view of uh, the booth a little bit further back. You can see there's that table again with the business cards, the uh, credit card signs. And the last thing I wanted to point out here was uh, Sometimes we need to sit down, you know, obviously a, a person standing at the ready in a booth is a lot more approachable than someone sitting in a chair just kind of relaxing and kicking back. You want to look approachable. You want to engage with, with people that pass by. You want to talk to those collectors, those people that take an interest in your art. Um, so uh, it's good to be standing and be at the ready to interact with people, but some of us can't always do that. You know, some of us have limitations. Some of us have disabilities and we're not able to stand for an entire day. I know that um, in my booth, I actually put uh, something called fatigue mats under my carpet. And those are just big, thick, rubbery mats that are a lot more comfortable to stand on all day than standing on asphalt or concrete. So uh, those, those can make a big difference. They don't cover the entire space in my booth, but they might cover uh, you know, they might be two feet by three feet, and I might put two or three of them out towards the corners of my booth, somewhere that I can stand um, when my booth is starting to get crowded, where I can talk with someone, but not be blocking people from getting to the dressing room or looking in the mirror and those kind of things. So those are helpful, but also it is good to have a chair. Um, and if you do have a chair, I recommend having a chair that is elevated. This particular chair is what's called a director's chair. And if you notice, it's not the normal chair height that sits up a lot higher. Um, and the reason that you wanna have a chair like that, it's good to be able to maintain uh, eye contact with the people that you're talking with. Um, and you want to stay at the same level as them. You want to be at eye level with them. If you're sitting in a standard chair and someone is standing up over you talking to you, um, the body language is really kind of an awkward position to be sitting in a chair looking up at someone over you. It feels a little bit awkward and uncomfortable for uh, the person you're talking to as well as yourself. So think about sitting in a, uh, a, an elevated chair like a director's chair. So um, I think that is the last slide and that is the last thing that I wanted to point out about this uh, this booth setup. So I uh, am happy to uh, take questions, um, to uh, 
to provide more information or go over something that maybe wasn't clear. And I want to point out that I do have virtual a virtual office hour on Wednesday, May the 13th from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, this is the registration link for, for the virtual office hour. Also, you're welcome to contact me directly. Um, this is my email, Leslie at LA Deer Apparel. Uh, and I'm happy to take those questions. I can take them and answer them online on Wednesday, or if it's something um, that you just prefer to talk to me directly about, I'm happy to help with that too. But uh, um, I have enjoyed sharing just what little bit I know. And uh, I'm happy to um, take questions now at this time. Thank you so much. So much. I really appreciate it. Um, first question that I have is from Stan through our Zoom call. He is asking, um, he would like to know um, more about like handicap services for these art markets for those with um, those with disabilities. As far as being a, a, a presenter there, as being an artist, I think that it varies a lot from one market to the next, what they're capable of. Um, so you might want to contact the organization directly through some of those links to the art markets and, and see what kind of surfaces they have available. Um, I know that at a lot of the art markets that I have gone to, especially the indoor markets, um, they have a lot of volunteers there available to help with uh, loading and unloading and transporting things for you. They, um, the one that comes to mind for me is Cherokee Art Market uh, and also a, a smaller art market here in Oklahoma that the Chickasaws put on. Uh, both of those markets, they have huge staff and, and um, army of volunteers that is there with uh, uh, dollies and carts and things to help transport all of your artwork for you. So I think that um, they do offer as much services as, as they possibly can. And some there again, just may be better than others. So the best thing to do is probably to uh, contact the um, organization directly. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the next question is kind of a question comment combo. And it was from Facebook Live from Kalani. Uh, Sounds like he's a performing artist and he says, continue to flood social media with our content. Keep on sharing and share it all on Facebook, fan pages, Instagram, Twitter, press kits, emails, etc. Repetition is key. It is okay to do live on Facebook and Instagram and promote your show. People post, uh, people post one post a day. I tell people post four to 20 times a day. Flood social media, LOL. And I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on that comment. I think that that is um, probably good advice. He sounds like he might be a performing artist himself. So um, I think that definitely more than one post a day because I think, again, it's, it's just like in advertising, the repetition is what makes it stick out in people's minds. People might look at something once and it just might go right over their head. They just don't even, don't even, really it doesn't register with them but then they see it again and it stops and they're like wait what is this i've already seen this once they see it a third time and they're like hey wait this is really getting out there i better pay more attention to it you know or a fourth or fifth time it's like i might be the only one missing out if i don't attend this you know i think that you really do have to keep that repetition you have to keep it in front of people's eyes to keep it in their mind so i agree with it personally I'm just checking uh, Facebook Live as you were chit-chatting. I don't have anything new questions wise and it looks like on the Zoom call, um, there are no new Q and A's. Um, so we still have a few minutes left. If you, did you feel like you wanted to talk about something else in particular, Leslie? Mm -hmm. That you felt like maybe you felt like you wish you had a few extra minutes to cover? Well, maybe we can go back and look at some of these websites again for, um, oh, some of these art markets and, and just take a look at their websites. I think that there are a couple that actually might have their applications online available and we could look at those and just talk a little bit about um, what all is involved in the application, you know, because that's certainly um, no small production in itself to have all of that information gathered up and at the ready to apply. So um, I think this one, let's try the Idle George. Uh, this is application. So give me just a sec here. Uh, 
Okay, so this is the Idol Jorg, and um, again, they their event usually takes place at the end of June, but um, let's see if here if I can go a little slower. Well, and it, and as far as applications go, they were accepting applications uh, through almost the end of January, so six months out, that's good to know. Um, but let's just kind of look at an application and see what all is involved in an application here. So it, it does start out with some of the basics, uh, you know, your name and tribal affiliation, which is something that's also really important to, to point out is that all of these art markets do require you provide uh, documentation for affiliation with a federally recognized tribe. So um, a lot of times they ask you, they, they include it on your signage and they include it in any promotions that they might put you in. So they like to know your tribal affiliations. Then it's uh, pretty much address, email, contact information. But then, uh, you know, you can uh, select the divisions that you uh, are going to present artwork in, whether it's paintings, sculpture, poetry, basketry, weaving and textiles, dolls, uh, jewelry, beadwork, cultural items. And the same goes, I think, for most art markets. Uh, where they say only artwork in your approved divisions will be allowed into jury competitions and sold during markets. So you can't say like, I'm going to make sculptures and show up with, um, you know, uh, beaded um, rear view mirror ornaments or something. So uh, you definitely have to, to nail down exactly what kind of, uh, what kind of products uh, you're going to sell. They have a section here for youth artists. Um, and then uh, I guess youth artists have to uh, share maybe with an adult. And then here's a little bit about booths. It's good to know, you know, we talked about booth fees. There's application fees and then there's booth fees. So booth fees, um, the Idol Jorg has uh, two different spaces where you can have a booth. You can have the front lawn, uh, or you can go inside the museum. So it looks like there's a ballroom and a hallway. So, um, and again, the booth space varies uh, depending on the location. You can see on the front lawn, you can have a nine by 20 double booth, or you can have a 10 by 10 tent. Uh, and there are the fees associated with that, $300 for the double booth and uh, $450 for the, the, the tent. So um, if you go inside, then there is an eight by eight, eight, by eight in the uh, commons hall. Uh, and I guess they don't allow sharing maybe because that's a smaller size booth. Um, or it, it costs looks like $25 more. It's $275 for uh, a, a single booth in the commons hall and it's uh, $300 for a corner in the commons hall. Um, and if you go in the ballroom, eight by 10, 350, uh, a corner in the ballroom is 375. So they prize those corners a little bit higher than um, any other space. I've never actually had a corner, so I, I, I can't attest to whether or not that is advantageous or not. Again, maybe it just depends on what your product is and what, how you're going to display it as well. So, um, and they want to know if you're going to be using uh, display panels, walls in your booth. Do you require electricity? Um, and then they give you options here for extras. So um, single booths, they tell you right up front what it is that they provide for you. Single booths include one table and one chair. Double booths include two. Uh, you can also request more things like extra tables, extra chairs, uh, but there's a fee for that. So wire racks available inside only six foot tall with two to three foot wide sections hmm interesting okay so they want to know how many you want so it says of course the disclaimer they do their best to accommodate you but you know final final assignment is up to them and you know sometimes it doesn't do any good to ask to be placed somewhere else a uh, fee for applying here at the Idol Jorg Museum is $25. Whoops, just lost my spot. And um, where are we? <laughs> a 
Okay, come on. It's playing with me now. There we go. So the fee is $25 and um, you can apparently um, print out the application, maybe and mail it in with your money order, uh, but uh, you can also do it and pay online, I think. Some, some, all art markets are different as far as refunds and cancellations. Uh, some will give you a full refund by a certain date. And then sometimes there is no refund after a certain date. So, um, and here, oh, here's the information about the tribal affiliation. Please submit one of the following. They, they tell you what, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable as far as um, providing your documentation. And then uh, most all art markets have guidelines for their images. Sometimes they don't want your images to be over a certain file size or, you know, they want it to be um, a certain uh, DPI dots per inch. So uh, it's very important to look at their, their specific uh, requirements and make sure that you upload them according to that because sometimes you will uh, be disqualified or, or your application will be tossed out because you didn't follow the guidelines. So it's important to, to make sure that you know uh, what size files that you can upload. Um, and if some, some people aren't really good at, at resizing photos and knowing, you know, how to figure out what size your file is or what the DPI is. So find, find someone to help you. I tend to see that lots of younger people know how to do that really easily. So. Uh, look for some help if you need help, but make sure you get your files in the right size and right format. They also a lot of times want um, you to put uh, some documentation with the images, an image description, so they know what they're looking at. A lot of times they want the, the uh, name of the piece of artwork, they want the dimensions, they want the uh, materials that it's made of, they want to know the techniques that were used. Um, and sometimes they allow you to give even more information about it than that, like what your inspiration was or what it represents. So um, definitely provide everything that you can for those. Um, and then it tells you how to submit them. So um, selection for the signature image does not guarantee any award in the jury competition. I'm not even sure what the signature image is there. I have not been there in several years, so I'm sorry I can't help with that, but I could maybe find out. Um, and here is where you um, submit your descriptions for your images. Again, see the title of the art piece, what division it is, what medium it is, what year it was created, and the size. So here are some of the uh, rules and guidelines. Um, that are enforced throughout the event. It's got to be your original artwork. Um, be respectful of other people's booth spaces. You know, stay within your booth space. They don't like it if you come too far out forward into the walking space uh, in an art market. You, they want you to not put stuff behind your booth or beside your booth. Um, and that's something that you really have to think about too is storage space. Some of us display things on tables and we can put a tablecloth over a table and cover it. So there's your storage space right underneath that table. You can put all of your Rubbermaid totes or whatever it is that you have. Um, but definitely think about where you are going to hide your packing materials and your shopping bags and all of those kinds of things um, because you don't really want to clutter, clutter up your booth and you don't want to infringe on another artist and have things spilling over into their space. I personally don't have any tables in my, um, my booth space. Uh, I have garment racks, I have mirrors, I actually have a portable dressing room, uh, I have uh, displays, dress forms, things like that. So uh, what I have figured out over time to hide my storage, a lot of things that I have to hide during the day are lots and lots of garment bags, uh, shopping bags, tissue paper, um, and I actually take one garment bag on a hanger that's empty because the clothes are on the rack and I will stuff all of the other garment bags. Well, actually they're folded up nice and neat, but I will put them all in the one garment bag that's hanging and it'll go to the very back of my rack. So when I zip it up, everything is in that one garment bag and, and it's just about as neat as I can make it really since I can't hide it under a table or chair or anything. So you've got to kind of get creative with storage space in your booth sometimes. 
back to the rules and regulations though, um, you have to be present and remain on site throughout the entire event um, to, to work with the public. So, um, and you get in trouble if your booth space is not set up on time. They don't like that either. So there are lots of rules to abide by. And when it's your first time going to an art market, it can seem like an awful lot. But again, if you do your research and you plan ahead and you know what you're walking into, you can be just um, relaxed and, and not really have to sweat 90% of this stuff. Um, let's see. Well, they talk about taking special orders and um, uh, how to deal with your, your collectors handling special orders um, because if you don't fulfill your order or deliver the artwork in a timely manner, um, it reflects badly on the art market and the organizers of the art market don't like that. So you wanna make sure that you, you handle your orders and take care of business in a timely manner. And you have to agree to all of that and sign. Uh, and then you can upload your files right here. And then it says um, they won't accept your application until you pay your fee. Um, after submitting this form, you will be redirected to a purchase page to pay your fee online. And then you just upload everything and hit apply. It's as easy as that. So um, that's kind of uh, what it's like to apply to a major art market. There, there are little things that are different here and there, but in general, they require the same types of information and have the same types of rules and regulations. So um, that is a good um, kind of an idea for, uh, for what's required to apply to an art market. I'll see if I can find another one here to um, apply to or look at an application for. Um, while you're looking, Leslie, I do mm -hmm. have, um, well, a comment question and then another question is that Matthew oh, on good. Facebook Live shared that the Cherokee art market is still on for October. Is that correct? Have you heard anything? Um, let's look at their website. You know, I was looking at it the other day and I can't even uh, remember. Let's check out their, their webpage really quick and see what we got here. And then um, I guess another question while you're looking at that is uh, something that I was thinking about is that um, are there any sort of, because um, you were saying the cost, which is pretty normal, 300 bucks for a booth, et cetera, the application fees that much, you know, but are there any art markets that have some sort of payment assistant or applications for booth fees to be covered, things like that, um, that people may have, may, might be able to look into? I think that some of them do, and that's not an area that I am really well versed okay. in. Um, but I have seen that on some of my art market applications before. If you need assistance, you know, um, click here. And I honestly have not ever really looked into it. Uh, but I do know that there are things available for, for some art markets assistance to um, help pay for your, your application fee or your booth fees. So um, it is available, but again, it varies from one art market to the next. Not all of them do that. So uh, I think that they do uh, have things like that that, they, that you can apply for as well. And I would assume they're probably very competitive. Uh, but uh, again, it's just one of those things when you research that art market and look on their, their website is really the greatest wealth of information. And certainly if you don't see what you're looking for, there's always contact information on their websites where you can either send an email or pick up the phone and call and, and ask those questions, you know, what kind of services do you provide for, uh, for disabled people or what kind of um, assistance do you provide in paying the booth fees. Uh, so, so if you don't find it on a web page, definitely just pick up the phone and call them or send an email. So uh, I've got the Cherokee Art Market site up here, how to apply the information here says uh, 2019. So I'm not sure, and that's, that's the how to apply. Um, it says next show, October 10th and 11th. Um, here it is when, October 10th uh, and 11th, 2020. So it looks like as far as just looking at their website here that this is still, this is still um, planned as scheduled at this time. And I think some of those markets that are a little further out, like uh, Cherokee Art Market, are still kind of taking that um, 
approach to just waiting and see how it goes for a little while. So this one may still be on. Uh, according to the website, it looks like it is still uh, planning to take, they're still planning to hold their event in October. Yeah, and just to add a comment, um, for Native Pop People of the Plains, I believe that the board for Native Pop is meeting sometime this week to talk about um, if the event, the art market is going to be moving forward or not. So I, I would recommend um, people checking out the website and uh, Native Pop's social media um, Facebook page for more information in the coming week with that. Yeah, definitely. Again, you know, I think it's just so helpful to be able to refer to a website and and find all the information you need. <laughs> Back, you know, like 20, 25 years ago, it wasn't that convenient. You know, you had to really do some digging to find a phone number or address to get a hold of someone to ask those questions. But now it's so convenient and maybe I'm just giving my age away, but <laughs> it's so easy to be able to do that now to just look up the information and check the website. But uh, Native Pop, yeah, um, I didn't see anything on the website that said cancel. So like you said, they're going to meet here again or, or make a decision soon. So that is one that I want to check out. I have not ever been there, but I would like to go and look at it. Even though I, I was telling someone, I said, uh, I know it's the people of the Plains, but I'm not a Plains strike. Can I still come? <laughs> oh, for sure. I, I've actually um, been the volunteer coordinator there for about six, seven years. <laughs> yeah, so, they said, uh, yeah, yeah, come on. <laughs> Heck yeah. Why? Everybody's welcome to come. It's a great community event. Um, and I can't say anything horrible at all. It's been such a lovely experience. And I've made lifelong friends there. And the volunteers that have helped out are very community focused. I mean, warm fuzzies all over the all over when it comes to native pop and the fashion show is always great and the performers and it's just it's really at the heart of the you know indigenous peoples of the plains the Oshati Shakuin and other people that are coming together to support each other and really share their ways of knowing and their knowledge with non-native and other native people so i know it's like a little mini promo for native pop but you know it's <laughs> I'm, I'm all about supporting that type of interaction and also just being the volunteer coordinator for so long it's 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 such a great experience and i have a feeling that a lot i bet you every single na um, native art market that you shared has that same kind of vibe but just on different scales and different focuses so right um yes i'd highly recommend you applying but definitely check out in the next week what pop's doing but um i definitely learned so much today, Leslie, from you, and it was such a thrill, and really it's an honor to hear your subject matter expertise on these topics and um, your wealth of knowledge on it, sharing those links. I put it on both Facebook and Zoom, as well as the registration link. So if anybody has questions after uh, this session's done, like, gosh darn, I totally forgot to ask Leslie like that one question. You do have another <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> to take part. Um, it's going to be a Zoom call as well as a Facebook Live. So please join us again. It was a pleasure, all the questions that we got from everybody and all the kind words that people shared. Um, and yeah, we look forward to speaking in more detail on Wednesday at 2 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, again, Leslie, thank you for your time and um, yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm just really happy to be able to be a part of this resilience webinar. I've enjoyed it. And I, again, I just, I don't know at all. I just hope that I could share something with somebody that might be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody on Facebook Live, as well as people on Zoom. We always appreciate the support and love that you send us and all these amazing questions, keep them coming and um, have a wonderful start to your Monday, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you. Bye. Bye.